So Go 1.25 is currently in the release candidate phase and while it doesn't really give us new shiny things, it comes with a lot of improvements under the hood. That's why I'm quickly going to talk about a few features that are worth mentioning, at least for now. And clearly I cannot really talk about all the changes that have been made in Go 1.25 because there are quite a few changes. Okay, let's just get straight into it. And one notable change I cannot really demonstrate is the new Green Tea Garbage Collector. Basically, Green Tea is a garbage collecting algorithm that is optimized for small objects or programs that create a lot of small objects and really run on modern machines with multiple CPU cores. Now to sum up this kind of new approach with the green tea garbage collecting algorithm, the Go team actually expects a 10 to 40% reduction in garbage collection overhead in real world problems that heavily use the GC algorithm. Now, I think it's still worth mentioning that this garbage collector or new algorithm is still in an experimental phase and clearly the implementation and design can change in the future. But let's just look at some code and check out new things that come with Go 1.25. Okay, we all hopefully know how to use a weight group in Go and what actually the purpose is of this weight group. If not, feel free to check out this video here. I've made an in-depth explanation what a weight group is and the overall concurrency functionality in Go. Now there is a beautiful improvement in Go 1.25 that pretty much just saves us some lines of code here. So I'll quickly showcase the old way of leveraging this wake group. So what we can do is just create a new wake group and we are obviously using the sync package here and then we say wake group. Then we just add one, right? We want to increment the wake group counter here. And then we are going to use an unnamed anonymous function here, which is then passed to go to basically run as a go routine. And we are going to run this as well. Now then we're going to say defer wg dot done to decrement the weight group counter in this case. And then we're going to say print line and let's just say some go fun for instance. Some pretty basic stuff. By the way, if you don't know the defer keyword, I've already made a video about that as well. So feel free to check out this video as well. But clearly we can do this one more time. So let's just copy this whole functionality. So we increment the weight group counter here again, and then we spawn a new unnamed anonymous function that is basically passed in as a go routine here. And then we say defer wg done as well. And then we say wg dot wait to wait until the weight group is actually at zero again. And then we say print line done. So far pretty basic. And clearly if we run this now with go 1.24, we actually see the expected result. Now go 1.25 actually comes with a new kind of utility function for our weight group. And this utility function is dot go. Now, before I will demonstrate this dot go functionality, let me quickly demonstrate this functionality in their official GitHub repository. All right, and this is actually the go function. And as you can see, it's nothing more than syntactical sugar here. It literally just increments the weight group counter for us and then kind of creates an unnamed anonymous function, which is spawned inside of a go routine. And then clearly it uses wg.done as well to decrement the wake group counter. So coming back to our code, it's literally the same we did here, right? And pretty much you want to use the go function always when you have this kind of pattern, because it's just a bit cleaner and less error prone when you forget for instance, to really increment or decrement the weight group counter in this case. And the weight group dot go function actually eliminates a few lines of code here. So what we can say is wg dot go, right? And then we can just use a function here. And then we say some go func for instance. So we don't need to increment the weight group anymore. And we do not need to decrement the weight group anymore. So if we now spawn two dot go functions here, and then run this code, in this case with go 1.25 RC1, which is the release candidate, we will actually see that it still works, which is quite cool. All right, let's just remove this code and let's just get into the next big feature, because this is actually huge. So the next big feature I actually want to demonstrate here is the JSON v2 module. 
and it has a lot of braking changes but comes with a lot of nice additions and better efficiency. So it improved the decoding performance and for services with lots of JSON requests and responses, this pretty much means faster API respawns and lower CPU usage. Now the basic JSON.marshal and JSON.unmarshal functionality work as before, but there are some interesting changes as well that I'm going to quickly demonstrate here. And what we're going to say is, or what we're going to create are two structs. The first struct is actually the server metadata struct. And then we also have a server status struct. Now I'm just going to mock this data, right? It's not a real world project, just going to demonstrate a JSON v2 package here. And in a server metadata, what we have is the region as a string and then we just use a struct tag and we use json and then region so far nothing really special right in this case it just maps the json region to this struct field we can do the same with like the instance type for instance and here we say instance type now in this case the server metadata just contains details about the server's configuration right and then we have the server status struct which just represents the full status report from the API, for instance. And what we can say here is we can define the server ID, which then is for the JSON key, the server underscore ID. And now things get a bit interesting because what we can say is we can use server metadata because obviously we want to have the server metadata in our server status struct as well. And then what we do, which is a new feature in the JSON v2 package, we are going to say JSON and then we're going to say comma inline. Now what is actually going on here? It's quite simple. Now the inline tag actually flattens the server metadata struct and therefore the region and instance type fields of our server metadata struct will actually appear at the top level of our server status struct in this case, as if they were declared here directly. Now just FYI, the first part before the comma is actually the JSON key name and the parts after the comma are actually the options or modifiers for how the field should be handled by the JSON package. And whenever we have nothing before the comma, it just means that the package will use the go field name. All right, that's pretty helpful. Let's look at another one and let's just say that we have a last report time, which is of type time.time. .time. And what we can now leverage here is first of define this JSON key, so last report time, but then we can also use this format template thingy here. Now, what is actually going on here? So basically the format and then date only tag tells the JSON package to expect and emit the date in the following format, which will be the year and then the month and then the day. Now this is just one format template we can actually use. There are several others as well. And here we are just saying that it should use the date only template for formatting. Now the last thing I want to demonstrate is actually pretty cool as well. And what we can say is metrics and then we have string and any and then we use JSON and then the comma again. And then we say unknown. Now here the unknown tag in this case collects any JSON fields that really do not match the structs defined fields into this map. So this is pretty useful for handling unexpected or extra data. Like in this case, for instance, the CPU or memory usage. And let's just make use of this inside of our main function. What we can say is just define quickly a mock JSON response here. Now this is just, like I said before, a sample JSON respawn that just comes, for instance, from our monitoring API. And notice it also includes the CPU usage and the memory MB, which are not really explicitly defined in our server status struct. And also one more thing, if we would marshal like time.date, so for instance, this here, time.date, and then we say like the date we have here, and then we use some arbitrary values here and then time UTC, it will actually format to this date. So 2025, 06 and then 28. So the time portion in the end will be omitted because we've used date only as a template formatter here. All right, let's just use this JSON response. Let's just create a status report here of type server status. We can also rename the struct, by the way, to like server report or something or server status report. Then we say error and then we just say JSON or unmarshal in this case. And then we define a new byte slice and here we use the JSON response. And then we say the pointer to status report. 
Because in the end, we really want to unmarshal the JSON response, in this case, the string into our ghost struct, we need to pass in a pointer here because unmarshal actually needs to modify the value of the status report variable. So it kind of needs to populate the fields. I hope this is clear. Now then let's just check for the error here. We just return and then let's just say print line error unmarshaling JSON. And then we say error. Now don't use this in production, obviously. I'm just going to demonstrate here the new JSON v2 package. Okay, and then we're going to print this status report and status report.metrics here. Also, we need to import the v2 package here. And what we'll actually see now is whenever we run this with go 1.25 and then say run may not go, we will actually see an error because the v2 package is in an experimental state and therefore we have to define this build flag here. So we say go experiment and then we say JSON v2 and then we run it again. And what we see now is basically the successfully passed struct in this case. And then we also see the CPU usage and memory MB in this case inside of our struct field, which is the metric struct field. So these were like the unknown metadata we've actually passed into the struct. And they are now inside of our map in this case which is a pretty cool addition. Now there's even more and new exciting functionalities in Go 1.25 and the JSON v2 package, and I might make a custom video about it. For instance, just the ability to really use custom marshallers and unmarshallers whenever you need, and we can even marshal values without really creating a single custom type is pretty nice. But let's just go to the next really important and big update here. Now, as you might know, applications mostly run in containers, like those managed by Docker or Kubernetes, for instance. The cool thing is with these systems is that you can actually limit the CPU resources for a container using a Linux feature called cgroups. Now, a cgroup just lets you kind of group processes together and control how much CPU memory and network I.O. they can actually use by setting the limits and priorities. Before Go 1.25, the Go runtime actually didn't really consider the CPU quota when setting the Go max prox value. So no matter how you limited the CPU resources, Go max prox was always set to the number of logical CPUs on your host machine. But now it finally gets container limits natively. Additionally, it also now dynamically adjusts if the limits change while the container is running, which is pretty helpful as well. Now this just greatly improves Go program's adaptability in elastic dynamic cloud native environments. And obviously you can just disable these features in Go 1.25 and higher as well. So let's just remove our old code here. And then let's just quickly look at an example. And we are just going to define a really simple program here. We are just saying go max prox and then zero. I'm going to explain this in a minute. Then we are just going to print this. So we say like go max prox and then we say max prox. And then what we're also going to say is we are going to kind of print the logical CPUs available on the machine. And we are going to do this by saying print line and then logical CPUs, for instance, and then we say runtime num CPU, right? So what is going on here? Just a quick explanation. Basically the first line just returns the current number of OS threads that can run Go code simultaneously. And passing zero basically just means, okay, just return the current value and don't change it. Like I said earlier, the num CPU function just returns the logical CPUs available on the machine. And then in the end, we are just going to print the current go max prox value, which is how many threads go will actually use to run go routines in parallel. Okay, now with that in mind, let's just quickly demonstrate this with go 1.24 and go 1.25. I'm actually going to write this command. I'm going to explain what's going on. So we have this command, but what does this all mean here? So first the CPU is equal to three limits or it should limit the container CPU usage to three CPU cores worth of processing time. Now it's worth mentioning that the minimum go max prox value is two on multi CPU machines, even if you set lower limits. Then we have this dash V, which pretty much mounts the current working directory from your host machine, which is signaled by this dollar sign and MPWD into the container at the path 
slash app. And then we have dash w app, which just sets the working directory inside the container to slash app. And then if we run this command here, we actually do get an error because go mod requires go that is bigger than 1.25, but we are running on go 1.24. So let's quickly change this in our go.mod file to go 1.24. Let's run this again. And what we will actually see is that we have 10 logical CPUs, which is correct. And then GoMaxProx is set to 10, which is wrong. Because clearly we've limited the container CPU usage to basically three CPU cores. And we want to kind of reflect this with our GoMaxProx value. And if we now change this back to Go 1.25 RC1 in our Go mod file, so we basically set the Go version here, this issue is now resolved. Obviously, we are going to use the Go 1.25 RC1 image here. And if we now run this, we will actually see the correct go max prox value which is a pretty massive change and a pretty important change as well and these were only a few changes that are coming with go 1.25 now another new feature will be the sync test package which i've already made a video about so feel free to check out this video as well anyway thank you so much for watching have a lovely day and bye bye